Hello and welcome to DesignCast, a podcast where I interview a wide range of excellent guests in design and STEAM education to get their unique perspectives. My name is Jason Regan and I use my 20 plus years of experience as a design educator to dig deep into complex issues. This podcast has one simple mission, to create a community of people around the world that are interested in design and STEAM education. Each episode, I chat with guests from all corners of the design world, from classroom teachers to authors and even to educational consultants. We discuss a wide range of topics that we feel are relevant today. I do want to ask you that if you're enjoying this podcast, please leave a review, rate, subscribe, share, or download from your favorite podcasting app. This helps the podcast get discovered by listeners that might not find it otherwise. Also, it helps me to continually define the direction of future guests and episodes. Feel free to drop by my website, www.jasonreagan.ga, to leave me a comment or to sign up to be considered as a future guest on future episodes. Also, don't forget to stop by Anchor and leave me a voice clip that could even end up in an upcoming show. Thanks for listening. So let's get to it. Welcome back to another edition of DesignCast. I'm so excited to be here today talking with you about this latest episode. So on this episode of DesignCast, I had the pleasure of speaking with Mr. John Halligan. He's held multiple roles as a teacher and a school leader. And John has worked in multiple educational institutions from primary to tertiary, state and private, from the UK all the way to the UAE. For the last five years, John worked as the head of development and recognition at the IBO in The Hague. John has several startup projects that he's currently working on, and we talk about those projects in this episode. A lot of what we've talked about deals with the IB Career Related Program, or the CP. We have a lively discussion around the components of the CP and how schools can get started implementing that program. John also talks about his new startup projects, uh, and they are Vi Education, which is the company that's setting up two different international schools in Switzerland, which are going to be CP-only schools. So that's a really interesting thing that we talk about. It's particularly interesting to me as I'm currently the CP coordinator at my school and I see tremendous opportunities with personal design pathways for schools all over the world. This discussion with John only confirms my philosophy even more. I hope that you can see the possibilities for your design programs in your schools after listening. I'd like for everyone who listens to please leave a comment or a review or just simply rate the podcast so that I can get more feedback on how to take this next to the next level with you guys. So please subscribe and share with your professional network. Now, please enjoy this chat with John and feel free to connect with him in the show notes with the links that will be there for you. So sit back, listen, and enjoy. Thank you. Welcome back to another edition of DesignCast, and I'm really excited to talk to John today. John, thank you so much for being here. Can you tell us a little bit about who you are and 
and what you do, because I don't know if all my listeners might know who you are. So if you can tell us a little bit about who you are, that would be awesome. No worries, Jason. Thank you for the invitation onto the podcast. A little bit about me. Okay, I'm a 52-year-old educator. I've been in education now for 31 years. I've pretty much done the whole gamut of roles within a school from teacher to, to school leadership. I've worked from primary through secondary, even did a bit of tertiary work. I've worked in the state sector and the private sector. I've worked everywhere between the UK and the UAE in my time Um, and for the sort of past five years I was head of development and recognition at the IBO very quickly that's working with schools as they implement programs and guiding them through that process and in terms of recognition it's about working with you know universities governments ministries of education I'm sure you realize and, and trying to get a fair deal and an equitable deal for the IB program that we're looking at and sometimes that that is how it fits in particular system. Uh, so how does the primary years program work in a particular system or the MYP? And um, But most of the work is at the sharp end, obviously, is where, you know, it's recognition for our students who do the DP and, of course, my favourite child, CP. I'm allowed to say that now. I wasn't allowed to say that when I was at the IB. And now, recently, uh, in January, myself and my colleague, Damien Bachu, who was the head of the DPCP uh, program, set up a company launching two schools, uh, starting off in Switzerland, the first one launched in 2021 will be uh, Montreux International School. Montreux, famous for the Jazz Festival and Freddie Mercury. The second one will be Nushital International School. And we're launching those under the umbrella of newly launched uh, organisation, which is VIE, uh, or in French, V, which means life, because uh, we're all about life-worthy education. And in English, VIE, VI, means to strive. So to strive to be your best self, uh, the best version, and also to challenge that educational uh, status quo. So there's a little bit of a rebel in there as well in terms of what we're doing. And those schools will be solely uh, CP schools only, not K-12. to It is just 16 to 18 CP schools that are really concentrating on multiple industries. That's a little bit about me and where I am at the moment. Well, I mean, we were talking a little beforehand and the CP is my passion as well. And I'm kind of late to the ball game, but I'm really excited to be part of that growth and to see how it's growing around the world. And so that is really exciting that you have schools opening up that are solely CP schools. And I'm really going to be watching anxiously to see how those develop. That sounds exciting. So (laughs) John, tell me a little bit about how you got into education. What led up to that? I love to hear the sort of the story, the journey of becoming a teacher. Oh, geez. I was like your worst student. If you can picture the worst student you've ever had, times it by 10 and you'll have got me. Um, So let me give you a bit of context. I started working when I was seven years old. I worked helping a, uh, that's when we had milk deliveries in the UK and I used to get up early and go and help our local milkman. I think I've had about 25 jobs since then, working part-time or full-time. I like I like to work. Uh, it was a clear purpose for me. I remember as a kid going, okay, if I work hard, okay, I get paid. It's a really simple equation. So now take that context to me in school. I'm in classrooms and if I didn't see the purpose of what we were doing, at best, I disengaged. At worst, I was that awful student who went, why are we doing this? I don't understand why we're doing it. What's the purpose of this? Now, when I was growing up, that usually earned you a clip around the ear or you were sent out of class. Some teachers could explain it to you. The general answer was because we have to. And sometimes, you know, as I sort of say, I, I, uh, I got sort of kind of labelled as being sort of a little a difficult child. And let's say uh, I, I got to know the head teachers quite well, usually. And, and sometimes, unfortunately, because I was a little bit cheeky as well and, and a bit of a rebel, uh, sometimes that resulted in, uh, in those days, the ruler across the hands or the, uh, the belt. But, you know, what that was that was just me so I dropped out of school I completely sort of moved away from it there was lots going on in my sort of personal life at the time I got a job went to night school my mum always instilled in me that uh, it's important to to keep learning Uh, I enjoyed learning as long as I knew why (laughs) I was learning you know and there was an end result there somewhere anyway I scraped sort of qualifications uh, enough qualifications to get a university uh, place And I decided at that point, and I remember quite clearly, I thought, well, there must be other people like me. And so I decided that I wanted to become a teacher. And what I found subsequently through my studying at university and subsequently my career, I really enjoy teaching. And I think it's vitally important that when you're teaching, you can very clearly articulate why students are learning this. 
okay it's either a step to somewhere else which you'll need that knowledge to inform you in the real world this way or there's a clear line to why you're learning a particular skill subject piece of knowledge whatever yeah and so that's that's how I got into uh, teaching I suppose through the back door and by being a, a bit of a rebel and an outlaw and I mean even my old school they all laugh now that I'm a, that I'm a teacher so anyway that's, that's, that's my story ironically my story I didn't drop out but I did not enjoy school I think I went into teaching because I didn't enjoy school and I knew there was other kids out there like I was when I was a kid and so it sounds very similar uh, in a different mm -hmm. context of course but it's funny to hear that and I think a lot of people are surprised I'm a teacher too so I completely, I completely get it. That's, and maybe that's why we're both drawn to the CP as well. I'm sure we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. So you mentioned earlier about this new endeavor that you have, Vi. Is that how I pronounce it? Vi is good. Yeah. Okay. Can you tell us just a, a little bit more about that and sort of what the overall kind of vision is? And you say it's only CP. How is that going to work for all of your students? Because, you know, in a lot of schools, the CP is a small portion of the mm. rest of the population. So what's the vision there for that? Our ambition here is, is to promote authentic education. Okay. Education is linked to the real world to launch students into careers, whether via university or directly into industry, okay? To do this, you need to bring the school, the university, and industry closer together. So initially, we're looking to develop a series of sort of career-related studies. We're only going to do the CP, so we're going to look at creating the career-related study that has the industry recognition and the university recognition tied in. So there's clarity for the students that they've got options. It's authentic in terms of there are key employability skills that not only that you can learn, but you can apply. I see, I read a lot about employability skills and I see that, okay, yes, there's employability, employability skills in the DP, but when do they actually learn it in the real world? There isn't an industry component in the DP, so they can't be authentic. So, you know, our aim is, like I say, to, to launch these two schools with that industry focus really initially beginning in the CP. So those will be our schools and where we're kicking off with hospitality in Montreux, but we're looking to develop into all types of other areas. Now the key to this is that's great in single schools and what you find with the CP is there is lovely island, what I call islands of excellence where CP schools are doing a great job. You know, they've got their industry contact, they've got that real world experience, they've got that university progression pathway for the students. You know what, they're well set up, but they're an island. And so the other ambition is to bring that into a network. So what we'll do with our career related studies, or CRS, is we're going to transfer those into an online environment. And we're gonna offer them up to schools and say, look, you can either take this as an online course facilitated in your school, okay, if you happen to have a teacher who's experienced in a particular industry that we cover so the content is all there and you can take with it and take it and run with it or the alternative if you don't have an experienced teacher in there then what we'll do is we'll teach it via an, our online environment okay and you can have a teacher in there who's facilitating who's looking after the well-being of the student who's looking at coaching at mentoring those students we'll take care of the content we'll take care of the uh, subject delivery but you're supporting in terms of uh, how you ensure the welfare and, and readiness to learn of those students that network those CRSs are not just in isolation so we bring the schools in we create that learning community and those schools who partner with uh, Montreux International School let's say in this case then come into that network where we've got the industry links and we've got the university links as well so we'll that's something we'll expand and develop and broaden as well so we have more of a global coverage so if you like I suppose the simple summation of that is that once we've built the model in a school we'll then share the model and build industry focused networks that have the uh, or industry sector focused networks so hospitality engineering coding or AI future technologies let's call them put them all in one bucket and then we'll bring in the partners in terms of the industry and the university and then there's a network of schools as there as well so cp coordinators can talk to each other within that network and we can provide some really unique experiences both locally and globally that's it as uncomplicated as i can make it in a nutshell well that sounds incredibly interesting and you're right there are islands of excellence everywhere you look i like that terminology but you're right there needs to be more of a an effort to connect those schools together and to share our expertise 
place. And I have a question for you regarding the CRS and that sort of thing. Are you looking to hire educators who have the expertise in those different fields as part of your recruitment or how is that supposed to work? So look, when you're developing a CRS, there's a couple of things that you that you'll need. Within our within our school system, obviously we'll seek that within the the school that we're launching, the particular focus, the particular industry, we'll bring together the university expertise. Okay, so there's the academic rigor in there. We'll bring the industry expertise together in the development phase so that there's real world application of the skills that are being taught. And of course, then we'll bring in a a tutor, a teacher as well, who's got that background in a school situation. So it's really trying to put, if you can visualize that as a triangle, it's putting those three pieces uh, together. Then it's just expanding out from that. That sounds like a recipe for success to me. And it's music to my ears as a newly authorized CP school. That's one thing we struggle with is we're the only one in the country at the moment. And there's only a few in our region. And so having that, I think, would be really, really helpful. So that sounds great. I'm really excited and interested to follow how this thing develops and rolls out. And Mm. it sounds really exciting. What's been easy for you or actually, you know, like what kind of resources have you found? I know you worked at the IB, so there were, you had Mm -hmm. access to those kinds of resources, but we connected through LinkedIn. Are you using that mostly or what's, what's your best way to connect with people? I mean, you you sort of started off saying what's easy about the CP and my IB and, and how I'm connecting. So look, I'm based out of LinkedIn. Gosh, that sounds interesting. Um, Basically, it's funny. One of the things I get asked, and I get asked this question quite a lot when I was at the IB, but also post IB, I'm getting a lot of, okay, so so give us some hints and tips about the CP. How do you implement it? How do you, you know, what are the key things that you've learned? I, you know, I've had five years at the IB and prior to that, I, I was an early implementer of the CP. I've implemented six, seven CP programs in multiple streams. I thought to myself, okay, how can I share this knowledge without being preachy, but also in a way that people can engage with? So I've just, funnily enough, and I suppose this isn't a plug, but I've done a CP screener series. So I launched the first one on LinkedIn just recently, which was how to implement the, the first stage when you're ready to implement the CP, trying to associate those with films. So that film was Back to the Future, because when you're first beginning to implement the CP, the first thing you want to try and think about is backward mapping. Okay, where do the stakeholders that I'm talking to, the people who are involved in it, the parents, the students, the school, what are their expectations, what are their requirements? Okay, uh, is this going to be a university-based CP? Is it going to be an industry-based CP? Is it going to be a blend between most, both rather? Okay, once you understand that, you can then start to back the map and go, okay, so what sort of program am I looking to develop in terms of the CRS? What does that look like in terms of the diploma courses that I'm going to need? That's called basically identifying the pathway and beginning to identify the courses that sit well with the course. And then underneath that is the package. So, okay, right. Now that I know that I'm doing engineering, I know that this is probably the best course locally for it. You might work with a university. That You might do a generic qualification like the, the BTEC, or there might be something at a government level or an industry level that you think, no, that's that's perfect for these students. It's It suits their profile. These are the best subjects to go underneath it. And then you start looking at the core and mapping that into the program as well. So sort of uh, my first one, like I say, back to the future. And I finish with a, a lovely quote from Doc Brown that, that says, if you put your mind to it, you can achieve anything. So there's six of those coming out. Uh, only just that one just came out this week i've kept it to three minutes because i know people uh, are busy and uh, i really don't want to drone on but i'm trying to make it punchy the next one up is jaws that should be quite interesting as well that's about bringing together industry and universities and how to create that sort of golden triangle with the school there's stuff on my linkedin about implementation of uh, cp i'm not a guru i'm not, the list isn't exhaustive and there are so many people out there that will be able to add to it but it's just a start for 10 but that's the best place to connect with me this podcast is a proud member of the teach better podcast network better today better tomorrow and the podcast to get you there explore more podcasts at www.teachbetterpodcastnetwork.com now let's get back to the episode That's fantastic. I know that's where I connected with you uh, originally. And so I appreciate you answering my email or or message. (laughs) And so thank you for that. And I like the idea of tying it in these screeners. And I can say that when we were going through the process ourselves, it was really valuable that we visited other CP schools that were already 
sort of doing it, but you got to remember their context, of course, is different. And so like you were, like you alluded to earlier. And so I think it's great that there's some things out there like this that you're putting together. So thank you for that on behalf of all the CP coordinators out there and other folks who are interested. Thank you for that. And so when you're doing the implementation of CP programs, well, he is the program, but anyway, what are some of the things that challenge you the most? What are some of the hardest things to get over as you implement one of these programs? I think the first thing is awareness. You know, you're up there and you're trying to explain to the, you know, the, as I said, the people that are involved, the students. Let's start with the internal community. It's allowing your internal community to understand what the CP is and what's the potential and really trying to move away from it, not DP light. Okay. It's a different qualification. You know, it's, it's like, you know, if you have a, an older sibling at a school, you are the brother of or the sister of. Okay. No, you're a person in your own right. So it's really trying to say, look, this, this is a standalone program. Uh, these are the qualities of it. This is the awareness. Trying to reduce the stigma of vocational education um, I use the word professional more because I think we are professionals you know whatever career you go into you're a professional so awareness would really be from the internal community and then it's understanding an awareness in the external community so that's when you're going out and you're you know you're looking to develop that pathway and, and progression for students going into universities and saying, look, this is the sort of uh, the calibre of the student that you're going to get. This is what they're going to study. Sometimes, you know, in my experience working for the IB, that's going in and, and meeting ministers of education and regulators and trying to explain to it. And that's a really difficult job because the CP in many ways breaks the mould. There's a lot of countries, particularly in, in Europe, that say, OK, you're either, you know, it's very black and white and binary, you're vocational or your academic. And I remember vividly having a conversation with a group of admissions officer in the Netherlands. And I said, hey, imagine if you've got somebody that's done 600 hours of practical engineering, has done a higher level maths, physics, and chemistry, and they want to come and do engineering, chemical engineering at your university. And these guys went, yes, we'd love to. We'd love to take that student. That's the ideal student. And I said, you can't. I said, because the regulators don't allow it, because they've done that professional course and that's a real shame and I see that the world over and there is a lot I mean part of my ambition this is where we get to back to V again is saying look this is life worthy this is life readiness education why is there the stigma against doing a professional based vocational course you know in in addition to the academic subjects surely that is the ideal student for going into either university or industry they've got the best of both worlds and yeah like i say awareness and understanding and you've got to be dogged in your approach to university because that's you know the credentialing is from and you know that's still very important and we won't go down that that rabbit hole just yet and then uh, with industry it's a lot easier because they're keen to be involved in schools but they you know some industries don't know how to approach schools they've all got a sort of community responsibility charter you know whether it's about engaging with the community and you know you try and leverage that you talk about you know building a pipeline maybe for employment there was one school that was right opposite a police college and they'd never had a conversation and yet the cp would be the perfect vehicle for as a precursor to that or a nursing college or whatever then you know it's making sure you engage with your local industry as well because that's if you're building that course that then brings in the authenticity which i spoke to so you know those are generally the start off kick off biggest challenges a cp can be very easy to put in if you go down a generic route the harder part is turning that generic route into an authentic route and therein is the uh, is the challenge for most cp coordinators and finding the time to do that and having internal stakeholders who will champion champion that for you i completely agree and i think when you're starting a program like this in your school you need a lot of time to cultivate relationships and to kind of knock on doors and to make calls and to reach across the road and meet with people and i think that also challenges the traditional schooling mindset of wait a minute what's this teacher doing what's this person doing? Why are they, why isn't that the marketing department or why isn't that this or that? And so that is a struggle. I completely concur with your assessment. <laughs> <laughs> totally right. I agree. So, so in thinking about the, I know you've been around the CP for a long time, you've implemented multiple programs. What's the vision? What would the ultimate vision be for the CP moving forward? Okay. Well, my, my biggest, my biggest issue 
is at that beginning point. The name, oh geez, you know, come on. It's really difficult. It was difficult when I worked in the IB. I've lobbied for that. I do hope, you know, the IB see it. There has to be a name change that has to be on a level with the diploma because it makes the conversations incredibly hard. You know, you've got a diploma and a program. Okay, it used to be certificate, which obviously was a downgrade. I know there's issues as well. I'm very sympathetic towards the IB. Don't, I'm, I'm not having a, a go at them. You've got to translate the name of this program into multiple languages. Well, at least at least the operating languages of the IB. You have to pick a name that describes the program, is translatable, and you don't need to re-explain it. And I mean, for me, I use the word professional all the time. Maybe we could call it a professional diploma, the IBPD. You know, maybe that's that's something, but there, there really does need to be an, a name change. The name was fine at the initial outset when Chris Mannix, God rest his soul, first designed the CP. I don't know if you're aware of Chris. Chris was a, an absolute visionary within the IB. And, and deserves all the credit for developing the CP. Now sadly departed. But the original intention was that we would supply a program that would give an industry pathway, okay? But the kind of market decided that actually, no, it's not just industry, it's industry and university and apprenticeships and, and it's gone from a sort of an industry focus to a a more university focused, which was something I don't think the IB quite envisioned being as popular a route. We have to now make a, that's where probably the certificate left and the program came in. Now I think it needs another, it needs, there needs to be a CP review essentially. Um, and I know Chantelle at the IB is doing a fantastic job with managing the CP and, and developing the uh, the core program. And I hope the IB you know, will support her and, and launch a full review. We can look at the name as a starting point. From my perspective, you know, it's very easy, you know, and I'm, I'm sure your listeners might say, oh, well, he's sitting on the side going, yeah, yeah, they should do this, they should do that once he's out. The other thing that what I'm trying to do for my part is to take away the pain. The biggest pain that you've already identified is, okay, when you start up, you're going, okay, what's my university pathway what's my where do I find a CRS to go in the CP that's meaningful what's the industry pathway that can support that and like I say that and not just within my context but globally because we have students now that travel they're transient part of the joy of doing an IB is the mobility that it gives you so what we're trying to do and what we're at we're at the early paces is build those links build those platforms to say you know uh, my 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 vision personally is that Jason you'll walk into your class as a CP coordinator one day maybe it's with me and we'll look around at the uh, students who are doing it and you'll be able to say well those two are studying architecture those two are doing chemical engineering these guys are doing future technologies blockchain and ai hospitality you know and you can we can have so many different pathways because we've built the ecosystem a school can have multiple school partner multiple school partners multiple university partners multiple industry partners from around the world globally and these students you know can have the choice then what they do where they go and it's authentic because you're bringing industry leaders into the school so that's what I'm trying to do you know I'm trying to walk the walk and not just talk the talk but uh, I could do with a little bit of help from the IB. I agree Chantel's doing a great job the work that she's doing I do agree I think that the the name having the word career in it immediately builds a, a wall of a sense or at least a hurdle that has to be overcome and not always necessarily, you know, and so I like the word professional. I think I may start adopting that <laughs> as well in my conversations because I think that that's really important because when I have a little while to talk to someone and I'm able to explain these things to them, they get it and they agree with it, but it takes a little while, right? And so I mm -hmm. think something that could help us a bit more with that probably is a great idea as well. So I like what you're bringing up here. And so thank you for that. And I love that multiple pathways. Again, that's our goal as well. And each year we're adding more and more pathways ways for our students. Mm -hmm. And so I'm with you and I'm, I'm happy to partner with you however I can along this journey as well. And so um, tell me a little bit about what you're excited about at the moment. You have so much going on, but what are you really excited about doing? Gosh, uh, well, I mean, I'm in full startup mode at the moment, you know, and uh, that's the first time I've ever been in that 
particular environment, which is massively exciting, nerve-wracking, adventurous, pioneering, sleepless nights, etc. You can imagine everything that's going on there. Um, because we are, we are really trying to break new ground in what we're doing. But break new ground, share our thoughts. So I'm doing a lot of reading, a lot of thinking in terms of, you know, when you're in schools, it's funny, we tell IB students to do a lot of reflection. It's all inbuilt. It's cooked into the uh, program. And uh, a lot of my, well, myself, I can speak and a lot of teach friends. That's the thing we do the least, the time for reflection. Yeah, see if I can fit that in between a cup of coffee and going to my next class. It's actually massively refreshing at the moment to be reflecting, refining my ideas, really sort of going, okay, how are we going to make this happen? Learning new skills um, in terms of ed tech and uh, platforms and understanding those, beginning to look at the problems that schools have and how we could possibly be a solution for that. I've got that whole piece going on. And then we've also got, you know, the elephant in the room, which is COVID, where we're living in times where everybody's telling us that it, uh, either education is not going to change it's going to change dramatically. It's going to change a little bit. Credentialing is going to change. It's not going to change. You know, AI is going to suddenly, you know, spring out of the box and, and solve all our problems. You know, so that's quite interesting. Just, you know, now and again, I comment, but I'm um, just observing, reading, listening about how the effects that COVID will have on education, because it's not just its interest. It's not just, it's not just schools and the way we deliver education within schools. Bear in mind, school, school is the structure that's imposed on education. And nobody said education had to be nine till three or nine till four and, and divided up into blocks, et cetera. And, and Ken Robinson does that far better than I ever. That's the structure that's imposed, you know, now with, with that structure gone in many respects, you know, you've got with uh, my own kids, uh, I've got very flexible hours when they choose to work and when they have lessons because the school's gone down a very sort of more uh, organic approach to uh, education. Whereas, you know, you look at some initial schools tried to literally take the structure of school and the school day and just drop it online, which I know one particular friend of mine was spending a ridiculous amount of time online, 12 hours getting migraines and everything. So it's been interesting really just looking at that. What I'm excited about that in terms of where's this going to go? listening to the protagonists that will you know, advocate the various uh, directions. Ultimately, we are still, whilst it's interesting about the potential that AI can bring, and Diamandis will, will, is on, on one side of things, will tell you that this is kind of an irrelevant conversation because education is about quality and, and access. You know, AI will be able to provide that. So he's at one end of the spectrum. And then you've got the, very much the traditionalists at the other end saying, yeah, AI is great, but it's nowhere near where it should be in order to change the education system as we know it. So it's quite, it's quite interesting looking at that and seeing, uh, you know, watching, observing and, and leveraging where possible for our own uh, development, you know, where education is going at the moment. So that's kind of the things that are exciting me. Thank you for that. And I don't know if you you know, John, I'm collecting more and more interviews for this next season of my podcast. And nearly everyone that I've asked about, this has come up in this section where we've mm -hmm. talked about what's going to happen next and how do we prepare for that and what's it going to look like and what is my role. And so I think it's great that you're thinking in that direction as well, because it's going to, it's going to affect us one way or the other, either slightly or dramatically. <laughs> so it's, mm. it's definitely going to be something. So speaking of reflection, what kind of books are you, are you reading at the moment and, and, and interacting with and what kind of material are you reading or, or, or whatever reviewing at the moment for yeah. that that time yeah i've been looking at, at a couple and again i mentioned diamandis uh, you know he, he's done a, a new uh, a new book and there's an interesting section on education in there which is quite interesting then i'll go back to the sort of the the great thinkers of you know like fuller and perkins and stuff learning design but the, the two that stand out to me i'll pick two would be uh, i've loved a, a book by jim mckelvey called the innovation stack fantastic he was the guy that worked with the ex-head of Twitter, who I've forgotten his name, who uh, developed Square, which was the, the tool that you could, uh, small traders could use credit cards. That's fantastic. And the concept of an innovation stack sits so nicely with the CP and also school development. So that's, that's, a, that's an excellent book. It's great for startups, but it's great for, it wouldn't be an obvious choice for a school leader to read, but I would highly recommend it. Uh, and for a CP coordinator as well, when they're looking to design their program, fantastic because looking at what the problems you're solving and essentially an innovation stack is a series of solutions 
that you have to make in order to get to a, an end goal. The other one that uh, I'm loving is Matthew Said's Rebel Ideas, which talks about uh, what diversity is in terms of you know, leadership. How do you bring a diverse team together? How do you maximise their potential and ensure that you know, you're getting a, a broad range of uh, inputs and diversity in all forms. And so that was, that's been a, that's been a great read and, and really interesting in terms of how you, in education, develop strong leadership teams, okay, in terms of who you bring into that. Leadership teams generally are, are built around seniority, for example, and initiatives are, are made and, and sometimes edicts are, are given. And then the guy on the ground or the, the girl on the ground who's going, yeah, that's not going to work because... And they've never been consulted. So it's about bringing those diversity and ideas uh, within to, within your team. So that's been excellent. And, and applying that into schools, not just in terms of teaching, but in terms of the students and allowing that student voice to come through in how you're developing, I think is is something I'm, I'm you know quite interested in uh, in looking at a bit more. So those would be the I suppose the two big books that I'm reading at the moment. Well, I'm adding them to my list at the moment. So uh, as we <laughs> speak. So thank you for that. Those are I'm, I'm really. Excited excited about both of those ideas. And so thank you for sharing those. And so I know that you're connected with LinkedIn. I'm going to make sure that that's in the show notes. Is there any other way folks can get in touch with you if they want to interact with you? I've, I've, I've got about three Twitter accounts that I'm trying to bring together, but they can follow me on Twitter. I'm just starting to send some stuff out there. I mean, I've never really been a, a diehard Twitter um, poster, tweeter. Gosh, that sounds really bad. But, uh, you know, any, any help on there that if people want to follow or, or uh, connect with me, that would be great. Um, I'll post all, I'm posting my LinkedIn pieces and articles and uh, screeners on there so they can find me there. Just started Instagram. But again, I don't want it to turn into insta spam so i'm being very selective on what i do i'm not on youtube so don't try and find me there and if you do it's not me or, okay, or it's so not something you want people to see i got <laughs> <laughs> john this has been such a pleasure thank you so much i'm truly inspired i'm using my summer which we're in now to reflect and this helps me a lot it gives me more food for thought on my own reflections so thank you so much for agreeing to be here and i would love to have you back once the uh, school is up and running and to kind of hear how things sure. are going with that. And so I would love it if you would be uh, willing to come back. Always happy to. It'd be a pleasure. It's been great talking to you, Jason. Thank you so much, John. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed that episode of DesignCast. I'm Jason, your host, and I produced and created this podcast. If you have any input, I would love to hear from you. And I look forward to seeing you again really soon.